In the dramatic pictures that follow, we show the inside story of the FFI, fighting for the liberation of the French capital. Right up to zero hour, everything seemed normal. Paris, on the surface, was evidently still firmly held by the Germans. Then, as zero hour, the hour to strike approached, the streets became empty and ominously quiet. The hush before the storm. Then the storm broke. Paris tore down the hated signs of German rule. During four years, they'd suffered a multiplicity of German signs and posters and proclamations. Now, at last, before the arrival of help from outside, the people of the city rose to wipe out this humiliation. The building of barricades was an opening move in the plan to isolate units of the Bosch garrison. Don't be misled by the lack of uniforms into supposing the Battle of Paris was an impromptu affair. Every man and every woman of the whole great underground organization had precise orders. It was a fight for the liberty of the people by the people. The Hotel de Ville was used as headquarters. The police, who'd previously gone on strike, were now formed into a battle unit. They had as great a desire to rid Paris of the Bosch as any other citizen. The prefect, Monsieur Loisa, is among other chiefs of the FFI, whose leader is Monsieur Bidot. Some of them with their staff are seen here at headquarters. The underground army of Paris, after years of patient training and planning, had gone into action. The Nazis were in action too. They had tanks and all the rest of it, and they fought back as we shall see. The people of Paris fought at the barricades, they fought at the street corners, they fought from windows and rooftops. They fought for Paris. Another German eliminated. The fight in Paris was no riot, no skirmish. It was a bloody battle. And there were many casualties, many dead and wounded among the people. The FFI had its Red Cross organization in readiness for this moment. All these pictures were taken during the course of the battle, which lasted for several days. While the fighting swayed through the streets of Paris, while the wounded were being taken to dressing stations, everywhere the Nazis were being killed or captured. The fate of Paris lay in the balance. Then came the Allied armored spearhead, driving across the River Seine, northwest and southeast of the capital. They arrived to lend timely aid to the hard-pressed Parisians, grimly fighting from their barricades and rooftops.
American troops advancing to clean out a nest of Germans holding out in the Eiffel Tower. After a brief skirmish, they surrendered. The first British fighting men to enter the French capital received a tumultuous welcome from the Parisians. Four years had passed since British troops last set foot in Paris. Now they returned victorious. For Parisians, the culmination of these happy days was the entry into the city of General de Gaulle. To them, he symbolized the indomitable spirit of fighting France, the spirit he so courageously guarded during those dark years following the occupation of his country. Approaching Notre Dame, the enemy made a last desperate move. Snipers concealed on rooftops opened fire on General de Gaulle and his staff. Happily, they were unsuccessful and were finally rounded up. The Allied soldiers who took part in the freeing of Paris participated in the rebirth of the sovereignty of free man. For in President Roosevelt's words, Paris is a precious symbol of that civilization which it was the aim of Hitler and his armed hordes to destroy. <laughs> 